For centuries, the highlands of Scotland have provided a stunning backdrop to one of the world's most enduring mysteries. A terrifying creature that's been spotted beneath these tranquil waters thousands of times, but still remains unidentified. The Loch Ness Monster. Is it simply a legend? Or a case of mass hysteria? Or could it be much more? Is a massive creature actually lurking in the depths? To find out, we'll compare decades of encounters across Northern Europe and use modern science to create a brand new profile of the beast with help from the world's top aquatic experts. What might we discover? Could Nessie possibly exist in some form? Could it even be a new, never-before-seen species? Go! And if so, could we potentially find it and have an up-close encounter of our own? Tonight, we dive deep in search of the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, there's the bubbles. There's the bubbles. He's getting ready to come up. You've probably heard this one before. If a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? What about this? If a monstrous creature swims across the surface of a Scottish loch and no one takes a picture, was it ever really there? For over 1,400 years, according to thousands of eyewitnesses, the answer is yes. All of them saw something emerge from the depths of Loch Ness. The question is, what was it? Whatever it is, it's certainly camera shy. But that doesn't mean that Nessie can't be identified. In fact, we actually have a large pool of information to draw from. We have first-person encounters, recorded histories, and even some pictures and video. We have known species with similar characteristics that we can study for clues to Nessie's behavior. Add it all up, and perhaps we can build a profile of the monster to find out once and for all if the legend could possibly be true. With that goal in mind, let's start with a man who says he's actually seen the beast. Retired engineer Gordon Holmes is one of the few people who claims to have captured the Loch Ness Monster on camera. He's taking us to the exact spot at the water's edge where his life changed forever. I saw the monster at 10 minutes to 10 on the 26th of May, 2007. During the morning, I'd been doing hydrophonic research on the lock. In the evening, I decided to go up uh, to the lay-by, which had a good commanding view of the lock, about 70 foot above the surface. This was my fourth visit up to the lock, and uh, I hadn't actually got anything concrete, uh, evidence of something mysterious. Despite years spent waiting, Gordon remained determined to see the Loch Ness Monster. And on this day, his persistence finally paid off. I've been there for a few hours, and then suddenly I saw something coming towards me. I immediately reached over the back seat and grabbed my camcorder. I dashed out, slammed the door, and then suddenly I realized that's not what you're supposed to do. I've read that if you, if you see a potential monster, don't slam the door, because that'll frighten it. So I then ran down to the edge of the lay-by and realized it, it's disappeared, where's it gone? And then suddenly I saw it over to the right and immediately I got the camcorder and zoomed into its position. For the next uh, two and a half minutes, I was privileged to one of the most amazing sights I've ever seen. At 
As you can see from Gordon's footage, there is most definitely some type of large animal swimming across the lock. But what could it be? This thing was like bubbling along the waves. At no point did it break through the surface of the streamlined water flow. The creature appears to be moving in a serpentine fashion, almost slithering through the water. Based on the species known to inhabit Loch Ness, one might conclude that this is an eel. But when you analyze the video more carefully, the eel theory seems unlikely. I read somewhere that if you ever get a sighting of something like this, you should zoom in and out uh, so that the, able, the people that analyze the footage can always then estimate the size of whatever the creature was. And at the same time, you can prove it's not like a fake because she's seen it in context. In context, the animal appears to be at least 15 feet long, much larger than any freshwater eel species, and therefore, potentially, something completely unknown. It was certainly going at speed into the waves. It wasn't some sort of log. This was a creature that had energy, it had power. It was thrusting through the waves. In addition to the creature's length, experts were able to determine that it was moving at a top speed of six miles per hour. This is probably uh, the best footage up to this time of the so-called Loch Ness Monster. I realized this was a turning point in the history of the Loch Ness Monster. But Gordon is still unsatisfied. He hopes to eventually have another encounter with the creature, and this time, he plans to be ready with even better equipment. If money was no object, uh, I'd have my own re research boat with underwater robotic vehicles. Meanwhile, Gordon has purchased a hydrophone to pick up sound signatures in the water. A sky camera carried by helium balloons as a makeshift drone and a magnetometer. In order to understand Nessie's environment, should she exist, uh, you, you need to delve into all the parameters possible, the variables in the equation. But science alone may not be enough to catch a second glimpse. Gordon believes it will take some luck as well. So I've witnessed several times that tourists that come to the side of the lock and that you can tell they're praying to see the, something, to see the monster. And I, by chance, being in the right place at the right time, just happened to capture on film something remarkable. But of course, Gordon Holmes' sighting is only a small part of a much longer history for this unknown species. If we want to solve the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster, we'll have to go back a whole lot further. The Loch Ness Monster was first written about in 565 AD in the story of St. Columba, an Irish monk who was traveling along the banks of the River Ness when he happened upon a man's funeral. The townspeople explained that the man had been swimming when he was attacked and killed by a water beast. At that time, people most likely believed this water beast was a dragon. But as the centuries passed, people stopped believing in dragons. Yet the sightings continued, all in the same area and all eerily similar, a massive unidentified animal churning up the water as it swims across the lake. This was no mythical creature. This was no dragon. Witnesses confirmed that whatever it was, it was very real. Local pubs were full of stories of the mysterious beast. But the legend of the Loch Ness Monster wasn't taken seriously until 1933, when a reputable law enforcement officer 
Loch Ness Water Bailiff Alex Campbell spotted the monster multiple times. What's the most you've ever seen of it at any one sighting? The best view I ever had was the very first thing. I saw the head, the neck, and the huge body, which I'd say was about 30 feet long. And the skin was exactly like that of an elephant, wrinkly, tough-looking. Is it not possible, Mr. Campbell, that you're mistaken in this? Not at all. When all of this evidence is combined, it seems that there actually might be a large, unidentified species in Loch Ness. Monster or not, we can start to use this information to build a profile and find out for ourselves. Campbell described a beast 30 feet from end to end, with a four-foot-high body and a wavy, narrow neck stretching 12 feet long. After years of vague descriptions and tall tales, this was the first highly detailed account of the alleged creature that would soon be dubbed the Loch Ness Monster. And just a few months later, an even more spectacular bombshell fueled Nessie fever around the world. On April 21st, 1934, London's Daily Mail published what it claimed was the first photograph ever taken of the Loch Ness Monster. Sightings of Scotland's famed Loch Ness Monster have been reported since the 6th century. But it wasn't until April 21st, 1934, that the search for the creature truly took off. And it was all thanks to this. Known as the surgeon's photograph, the picture was snapped by London gynecologist Robert Kenneth Wilson while out for a lakeside walk and published in London's Daily Mail newspaper. The image appears to show a silhouetted figure with a long, slender neck, a small head, and a large body that's obscured by the waterline. Immediately after the photo was published, the British public began speculating on the nature of this mysterious beast. What could this photo possibly depict? Some suggested it was the dorsal fin of a dolphin or whale. Others thought it might be a submerged elephant raising its trunk to breathe. A circus had recently visited the area, giving more strength to this theory. But the most popular belief may also have been the most far-fetched. Many thought this was a creature that had been extinct for millions of years. It's a theory that continued for decades after the photo was first published. So what particular species do you think it is? The evidence, as I interpreted it, all fits, and I know this is a fantastic statement, but this all fits plethiosaur. Could it be possible that the plesiosaur, thought to have died out with the dinosaurs, had actually survived, only to end up here in Scotland? Before you decide for yourself, there's one thing you should know. This first iconic image was a hoax. In 1994, 60 years after it was first published in the Daily Mail, the true story of the photograph came to light. The newspaper hired big game hunter Marmaduke Wetherell to find evidence of the monster. Instead, he created a model of a beast with a long neck and attached it to a toy submarine. He then chose a trustworthy physician, Dr. R. Kenneth Wilson, to deliver the photograph of his creation. And the rest is history. But that one hoax doesn't explain countless other sightings and more recent photo and video evidence that has yet to be disproven. In 1955, Peter McNabb captured this image. In the 1970s, an American scientist shot this underwater photograph depicting a 30-foot-long flipper. And of course, we have the 2007 footage from Gordon Holmes. None of these sightings provide definitive proof of the Loch Ness Monster's existence. 
but they do suggest the possibility that some large species might be lurking there. The question is, what species could it be? Can we build a profile to potentially identify it? First of all, Gordon Holmes described an eel-like aspect to the front of the creature. His video shows that it can hold itself up near the surface for an extended period, with a cruising speed of six miles per hour. Therefore, something below the water is propelling it upwards as well as forwards. Most likely the flippers seen in this image. Unfortunately, this small amount of visual evidence can't tell us much else. But we do know one more key piece of information that's crucial to our profile. We know that if this species exists, it has managed to elude capture for more than 1,400 years in these Scottish waterways. Local water bailiff Chris Conroy thinks he knows how an animal could manage to stay undetected for so long in these unique conditions. Loch Ness contains as much water as all the rivers and lakes in England and Wales combined. It's the largest water body in the whole of the UK. It's absolutely massive. Really hard to comprehend just how big this loch is. Um, it runs from east to west. It's a total of about 23 miles long. It averages about a mile wide, and it's about 750 feet deep. If you look at the shape of the loch, you've got these really steep sides. The tops of the hills here are about the same height up as the depth of the loch, and they go straight down on the edges, very, very steep, and they, as you hit the bottom of the loch, it becomes very flat, very it's full of sediment, and you get this sort of bathtub shape. In other words, there's plenty of room in Loch Ness to hide. And even if someone were to search beneath the water, they wouldn't survive long. Loch Ness features a phenomenon called a thermocline, which causes deadly conditions as you dive down. It's a stratification of temperature. So as you go down into the water column, a relatively short distance, you suddenly hit a temperature barrier and there'll be a significant change in, in water temperature up to maybe around 10 degrees. Um, this affects the chemistry underneath. So if you are, if you're to go underneath that barrier, you'll suddenly become very, very cold. Even at the lock surface, the average water temperature is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Beneath the thermocline, without the protection of a modern dry suit, a diver could drown in under six minutes. And those freezing temperatures are paired with near blackout conditions. So it's an absolutely perfect place for something to hide. It's, it's very difficult to see anything. The water is very peaty, as we call it. Now, the peat is basically organic matter that's breaking down. It's washed into the rivers, and that comes flows into the loch, and you end up with this really dark, tea-colored water. OK, let's do a little bit of a test here, just to show you what the water's like in here. So we've got a, a, a standard whiskey glass. We just pop it in the water here, just in the top. You can see how clear it is. But don't let that fool you, because as you get deeper down, you'll see the, the color change. If you were to go just a, a little bit further down or towards the bottom, it would start to look more like this. You can see it's much more tea-like in color, and it's all the organic matter that's broken down leaves and other plant material that's washed down the rivers and creates this really dark color. While that unique watercolor makes the alleged monster hard to find, it also gives us a significant clue to its possible appearance. If it can stay undetected in these conditions, it must have a natural camouflage. Nessie's skin has often been portrayed as flat gray or bright green. But in fact, it much more likely matches the tea-like appearance of the surrounding water. 
a mottled brownish color. But if we hope to identify the Loch Ness Monster, knowing its color won't be enough. At 750 feet deep and 23 miles long, near blackout conditions below the water, and average surface temperatures of 42 degrees, Loch Ness is an incredibly challenging place to track down an unknown species. But if we hope to identify the Loch Ness Monster, at some point, we'll have to dive in. Fortunately, before we do, footage from several underwater cameras can give us a preview of what lives beneath the surface. A surprising number of species thrive in the loch, even at its maximum depth of 750 feet. We've got trout, brown trout, we've got arctic char, we've got eels, we've got lamprey species, um, and then we've got other species which have been seen here, which include the, in, in the records of sturgeon, northern pike, and perch. So in addition to the fish, mammals follow the fish into the river, and we regularly get seals living in Loch Ness, particularly the common or harbor seal, and it's an easy food source for them. And could it also be a food source for something else? Could the loch's population of trout, arctic char, pike, eels, and lamprey possibly be enough to feed a large predator all year round? Sounds like there's a lot, but actually, given the the depth and the size of it, there isn't as much as a density of food as you might think. The fish are generally focused in key areas. There are quite a few fish in here, but there's also a lot of nothing as well. But two times a year, the situation drastically changes, and Loch Ness becomes a veritable all-you-can-eat buffet. All thanks to the Atlantic salmon that return to these waters in large numbers annually to spawn. The salmon migrate up from, from the sea and uh, they use a lo the loch as a, as a refuge for them. It's a nice, because it's so deep and dark, they can hide in here. And they generally need a nice flow of fresh water. So they'll, you'll quite often find them at the mouths of rivers where they, they're waiting to migrate upstream to spawn. They're packing on these nutrients. And by the time they return to the river, they're, they're really um, fit, healthy, fat fish. Would this be enough food for a large predator like Nessie? Chris hasn't seen the monster yet, but thinks it is within the realm of possibility. I've been here six years, so I've still got time before I to see something. But I'll say my colleagues don't rule anything out. You do tend to see some strange things at strange times of the day and night. It does show you that things can turn up and things can appear that you don't expect. If Nessie exists, then clearly it needs to eat in incredibly large quantities. The spring and summer salmon migrations would go a long way towards sustaining the creature, assuming it could somehow live off that feeding frenzy through the less bountiful fall and winter. Sightings place Nessie at between 30 and 50 feet in length. For comparison, consider the great white shark which is half as long and averages 5,000 pounds in weight. Nessie, therefore, could tip the scales at upwards of 10,000 pounds. Based on a great white's diet, to maintain that weight, the Loch Ness Monster would need to eat around 250 pounds of fish per day during its feeding season to sustain it through the year. The creature's diet, size, and weight are crucial additions to our profile especially when added to our previous theories on its coloring, its movement speed, and its partial serpent-like appearance. Despite thousands of sightings and near constant speculation about the Loch Ness Monster, there's still very little agreement about its features or where it might be found. 
It's a problem that's been frustrating Nessie hunters for decades. We're not spending all this time and money trying to prove that there's a large unidentified species in Loch Ness. We know that. We've seen it and we know it's here. What we are trying to do now is identify the species. Today, a brand new profile is emerging, which once complete, could help us finally find the beast. But while most researchers have focused their efforts within the Scottish Highlands, they're ignoring a key data source. Because as it turns out, this unknown species might have a long lost twin outside the lock. In the 17th century, a similar creature began appearing here in northern Sweden's Storsjan Lake. The Swedes call it the Great Lake Monster. In the eastern town of Östersund, archaeologist Anders Hansen has been studying the Great Lake Monster for years and believes there is a definite link to Loch Ness. We know that people have always been seeing strange things in big waters, and this is part of the Western and Norwegian tradition, and even up to Scotland, that we have these sea serpents. There have been rumors of an unknown underwater species in Storsjan as far back as the 11th century, not long after rumors of Nessie began. One early description was even recorded on a Viking relic called the Frozo runestone that has stood in Ostersund since 1050. And as you can see, it's got this great serpent, this dragon on it. And this is what is said to be the first, actually first picture and story about the Great Lake Monster. A similar timeline isn't the only thing these two creatures share. Both Loch Ness and Storsjan are cold freshwater lakes, and both feed directly into the same common body of water, the North Sea. In other words, a migratory aquatic species could swim between both lakes. Physical accounts of the Swedish monster also line up with alleged Nessie sightings. People out fishing see, seeing something in the lake. Sometimes it's three meters, sometimes it's 15 meters long. Almost all the witnesses describe the monster with a long sea serpent-like body and the head of a dog or a horse. Some of them are quite dramatic, talking about the speed of the monster and how the mouth of it was so big that you could put down, I mean, your whole head in the mouth of the monster. Ready to see the archives? Yeah. We have it in the vault. Material or what? <laughs> Anders' colleague, Anna Engman, keeps careful track of hundreds of written witness statements at the Jamtli Museum. This way. Today, she's agreed to let us take a rare look at some of them. Yeah, Here that's it is. the one. Great Lake Monster. Storsjö och djuret. Okay, is all this about the monster? Really? Yeah, it's uh, all, all this is about the monster. So, this is uh, lots of um, observations from uh, uh, dating from 1990s until the uh, late 18th century. Okay. And this one is from around 1930. She's telling this story about how she, she saw the, the monster when she was uh, doing the laundry by the lake, and it was huge, and it was gray and ugly, she said. Gray and ugly? Yeah, gray and ugly. And she got so scared, she, she ran away, left the laundry and ran away, and uh, when she turned around, the, the monster was gone. Okay. Many sightings also describe a back that is covered in pointy, fin-like protrusions. A man who's seen the, the monster, he's seen something black, 
with three, uh, three bumps on it. Oh yeah, here we can see. The museum also keeps records of attempts to trap the monster, like one in the 1890s, sponsored by the King of Sweden, Oscar II. We have this huge trap, and it's said to come from a company that was established 1894. And the reason for the company was to catch the monster. And this big trap was supposed to be baited with a pig and sunk down into the lake. And to guard it and catch the monster, they hired a Norwegian whaler because he could use his harpoons. That early capture attempt failed. But the search for the Swedish monster continues today on the south side of Storsjan. Kurt Janssen runs the monster center there that monitors activity in the lake. Uh, the center was open in uh, 2012. Here at the center we are for the searching for the Great Lake monster. During the summer with the boat, and during uh, the nights with cameras, and hopefully that we're gonna find it and have it on picture. That's the goal. Kurt and his team set up two surface cameras, two underwater, a night vision camera, as well as one that's sensitive to temperature. Despite 24-hour surveillance, they have yet to pick up an adult specimen of the creature. But Kurt believes he did see a younger one. Many times we have seen something, but actually we don't know actually what it is. At one time, we saw a little baby from the Great Lake Monster. And it was posing up like this in the end of the picture, like Loch Ness. If one is willing to believe in the Loch Ness Monster, there's no reason to doubt Sweden's accounts of the Great Lake Monster. Perhaps its features can help add to our profile. Witnesses in Sweden have managed to spot two more key details. First, the addition of fins along the creature's back. No Scottish sighting has been clear enough to make this determination. Second, the Swedes describe a head that resembles a dog or a horse. While it's unlikely to be covered in fur, it does change our concept of the skull's shape, indicating that Nessie's head could taper into a longer, thinner contour, not unlike a dog's snout. So what do we have here? Two similar creatures, spotted along similar timelines, both in large, cold, northern freshwater lakes. And what's more, these two lakes are directly linked via the North Sea. If the Swedish and Scottish monsters are related, or even the same species, it raises a frightening possibility. Perhaps the Loch Ness Monster isn't trapped in the loch at all. For over 1,400 years, people have struggled to identify the mysterious creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. While definitive proof of the monster's existence has yet to be found, it's clear that something big has been spotted multiple times. Could it potentially be a new, still undiscovered species? In our quest to profile the animal, we've just made a shocking discovery. Another creature, described as nearly identical to Nessie, allegedly living 750 miles away in Sweden's Storsjan Lake. This is a potential game changer in our quest to identify the Loch Ness Monster. Is it possible that Nessie is part of a migratory species? If so, what does this mean about its behaviors and appearance? Believe it or not, the answers may lie 3,500 miles from the loch on the James River in Virginia, where ecologist Dr. Matt Belazic has been studying another migratory species for 12 years. 
We're at the VCU Rice River Center on the James River in Richmond, Virginia, and we're gonna be going after some spring adult Atlantic sturgeon. Atlantic sturgeon are the perfect species to study to figure out what it would take for an animal to survive in Loch Ness. Atlantic sturgeon cover a massive range. While you can find them here in Virginia, they're also one of the top migratory predators in the North Sea, near Scotland. Just like the alleged descriptions of the Loch Ness Monster, they're big, they thrive in cold water, and they're among the most mysterious and elusive hunters in our waterways. You could have a fish that's 12 feet long swimming under you, and you'd never even know. Once common in this area, Sturgeon hadn't been seen in the James River in generations. But then, residents began spotting signs of a mysterious marine creature in their midst. People were seeing these things with just quick glances. And you're like, wow, that was some kind of monster. And people's imaginations get rolling. My favorite was, oh, there's mutant sharks. In 2007, Matt caught the first sturgeon in the area in decades and finally identified the unknown creature. It was almost equivalent of catching a unicorn. It was a almost six foot long fish uh, covered in armor and uh, just something you didn't even think existed anymore. And we had it right there in front of us. There was no if, ands, or buts about it. It was right there. Since then, Matt and his team have caught and tagged more than 700 individual sturgeon, using acoustic receivers to track their migratory movements. So that's a fish. If he can catch one today, it could provide critical new information to help us identify the creature hiding in Loch Ness. Oh, there's the bubbles. There's the bubbles. He's getting ready to come up. As we continue to build our profile of the Loch Ness Monster, we've zeroed in on a compelling new theory. What if the creature is a migratory animal with a range that stretches far beyond the loch? If that's the case, another large migratory species, the Atlantic sturgeon, may hold clues to Nessie's behavior. Uh, we're getting ready to pull in the first net. There's the bubbles. There's the bubbles. He's getting ready to come up. He's getting ready to come up. Yeah, he's pulling. There he is. OK, hold on. Yeah, he's pulling. All right, we're done. Despite this fish's impressive length, it's only a medium-sized specimen. And we're just going to measure it down the length of its belly. OK. This fish is just uh, over seven feet long. But um, historically, there are records of them uh, twice as big as this. And there's unofficial records of 18 feet long. These sturgeon also have incredible lifespans. The biggest ones can live over 100 years. For our purposes, as we try to identify the Loch Ness Monster, we need only ask one question. What does it take for a massive North Sea predator like the sturgeon, and like Nessie, to survive for so long? One possible explanation is the sturgeon's natural built-in armor plating. This is the dorsal line of scoots right here. These are actually bone. It's a, it's a form of calcium phosphate, which is just like our bones. And it's actually wrapped all around the fish. It's got them on the side, and it has them on the belly. This is pretty much a suit of armor all around it. These bony plates, called scoots, have given the sturgeon the ability to outgrow, outlive, and outsurvive almost every other species in the North Sea. They are some of the ultimate survivors. 240 million years ago is, I, is the upper end of when, they, when these fish started to come around. And these fish have persisted that whole time. 
the fact that this fish here was dodging dinosaurs. I think that's pretty awesome. According to Matt, armored plates much like the sturgeons could be a perfect explanation for one of Nessie's key features as described by alleged eyewitnesses. A lot of the sightings in Loch Ness are uh, of like pumps on the side. Those could potentially be scoots, especially on a big sturgeon when the scoots will be really big and the ridge will be really tall. Is it possible that the Loch Ness Monster's famous humps along its back aren't humps at all, but instead are a series of bony armored plates? The Atlantic sturgeon may just have provided an important clue in our search. And other members of the sturgeon family tree could offer even more useful information. Atlantic sturgeon are really just bottom feeders uh, eating the bugs, but there's a lot of other uh, sturgeon species like the belugas and the white sturgeon that actually do actively prey on fish. And those sturgeon actually get really big. As you can see in this photo from 1903, beluga sturgeon have been documented at nearly 30 feet long. Considering their massive size, body shape, and ability to hide and survive in cold, dark water. The sturgeon is one of the closest species we can study to determine the behavior and appearance of the Loch Ness Monster. Despite their 30-foot length, beluga sturgeon can freely move between freshwater and saltwater while hunting their prey. And sturgeon have been found in both Loch Ness and in Sweden. Is that our answer? Could the monster simply be an overgrown sturgeon? As we're about to find out, the mystery is still far from being solved. Next time, there's a chance we've had physical evidence of the Loch Ness Monster for centuries. Go! And if that's the case, then we may know exactly where to look for our own encounter with the beast. It's one of the most idyllic lakes in the world. But for centuries, its dark waters have been thought to hide a deadly secret. A massive, unidentified species famously known as the Loch Ness Monster. Despite alleged photos, video, and thousands of eyewitness sightings. I looked over my right shoulder, and there she was. Many people believe that Nessie is simply a fairy tale. But what if there actually is an unknown animal living in Loch Ness? Can we combine enough information to profile the creature? In our attempt to find out if Nessie does exist in some form, We've taken a deep dive on alleged sightings throughout history. We've closely examined its habitat. And we've studied potentially related species for clues as to what the monster might be. Now, we'll reveal a brand new look that just might bring us closer than ever to identifying this possible unknown creature. Go! And finally, We'll enter the depths to see for ourselves and have a potential history-making encounter of our own. It was some massive than there. As we continue in search of the Loch Ness Monster. Our profile of the Loch Ness Monster continues to evolve. It started like this, the classic image from the 1930s. Before long, we added new features based on more recent encounters. But just as important as the monster's physical appearance, we've also built a key theory about its behavior. What if the creature is migratory? We haven't yet been able to confirm whether the monster can come and go from the lock, but there's a chance that the evidence may have already been found. The remains of a massive, unidentified creature, nearly an exact match for Nessie, washed up from the waters of Scotland, not far from Loch Ness.
This is the island of Stronse. Located due north of Inverness, it's a quiet and peaceful place for a seaside getaway. But as zoologist Jeff Swinney will tell us, on a summer day in 1808, visitors were met with a terrifying sight. A fishing boat noticed something unusual. Their attention was drawn to it by the screaming gulls that had gathered around this carcass, which had been washed onto some rocks. It was big, it was smelly. This was nothing like anything they'd seen before. The fisherman who had discovered the carcass, a man by the name of John Peace, approached it with a group of locals. The island dwellers were familiar with the occasional beach whale or shark carcass that could wash up on the Stronsay shores. But this was something very different and very, very big. What they found on the beach was an animal with a relatively small head, only about a foot long, and then a body which extended 55 feet. And they measured this, uh, so we know that the measurement was accurate. And about a quarter of the length of this appeared to be neck, made up of vertebrae, and then the rest of the, the vertebral column going off tail. There appeared to be three pairs of legs and the whole body was covered in what appeared to be matted fur with a mane of fur running down the back of the body. This must have been an extraordinary sight. Imagine this is what they would have seen. It must have been absolutely terrifying, disturbing. This huge, 55-foot-long, mysterious, six-legged, hairy animal just lying there on the beach. These were not just a new species. This was a new species of megafauna. This was a, a big animal. This was a sea monster. It was dubbed the Stronse Beast, and news of the discovery began to spread. News spread fairly rapidly worldwide that this sea monster had arrived on the shore. They convened a sort of tribunal with two local justices of the peace taking sworn affidavits from the local people who had seen this animal. But while the accounts of the beast were now officially on the record, nobody could do much more to preserve the carcass and the late summer heat nearly rotted away the remains of the mysterious animal. The animal lying on the beach had been trundled around in the sand quite a lot. Much of the skin had come off, and what you were left with were the fraying muscle fibers. Various bits of the carcass were collected by some of the local people, and some were sent uh, down to Edinburgh. The, the skull, the head, was actually sent to London, but unfortunately, uh, that has since been lost during the Blitz. The vertebrae of the animal, they were studied in Edinburgh by a very eminent uh, anatomist called John Barclay. He concluded that this was like no other animal. This, this was a new creature. An equally eminent anatomist in London was absolutely convinced that the remains were those of a large shark. The puzzling thing is that the local community on Stronsu would be very familiar with these big sharks. Therefore, how could anybody possibly mistake this animal 55 feet long with six legs for a shark? The observations were accurate. I mean, we, we have no reason to disbelieve the eyewitnesses. The remains of the animal that are still in the museum uh, consists of three vertebrae. I've had the opportunity of, of looking at the three vertebrae. After analyzing the remains, Jeff concluded that the Stronse beast shared many similarities with our potential profile of the Loch Ness Monster, including a long, narrow shape 
flippers on its abdomen, and of course, its massive size. This is the first physical evidence of a possible Loch Ness monster type creature in Scotland. Not a blurry photo or a fleeting sighting, but actual remains of a species that must have roamed the area's waters at some point. There are myths, stories, legends associated with many large bodies of water all over the world. Stories of unknown animals. Loch Ness in particular. It would, of course, be really exciting if we had some material evidence of a new animal, a bit of megafauna, a, a, a large animal, a sea monster. And until we have something to actually examine, I keep an open mind. Could the Stronse beast actually be the same species as the creature long identified as the Loch Ness Monster? The resemblance is uncanny, as is the timing. In 1808, the year the Stronse beast was discovered, there were alleged sightings of similar creatures in Loch Ness and in Sweden's Storsjan Lake. Is this just a coincidence, or were several of these unknown animals migrating through northern Europe? The mystery of the Loch Ness Monster has inspired generations of searchers trying to find this elusive species. But there's a chance it's already been found in the form of an as yet unidentified carcass on the shore of the Scottish island of Stronse. If the Stronse beast is in fact a match, it adds even more key details to our profile of the monster. The Stronse remains had three pairs of what the fishermen described as paws or flippers. This could explain the animal's ability to cruise along the water surface at six miles per hour, as seen in a 2007 video by Nessie hunter Gordon Holmes. It's also consistent with this photograph taken in the 1970s by a scientist who encountered a creature in the loch. The specimen at Stronse was covered in short, wiry bristles, most commonly found on marine animals who use them to sense the presence of food in deep, dark waters. If Nessie exists, it would need similar features in order to feed and survive in the near blackout conditions of Loch Ness. We've now added quite a bit to our profile, but one can't help but think that it still looks rather familiar. Perhaps it's time to revisit one of the very first theories on the Loch Ness Monster's identity. So what particular species do you think it is? The evidence, as I interpret it, all fits, and I know this is a fantastic statement, but this all fits Plethiosaur. Since the 1930s, dozens of witnesses have speculated that Nessie is a species we've already identified. Could they have been right this whole time? If so, the plesiosaur is an intriguing option. It's a type of marine reptile that dates back to the time of the dinosaurs in the late Triassic period. Plesiosaurs thrived for nearly 140 million years before supposedly dying out at the same time as their land-based contemporaries. But is it possible the plesiosaur could have survived? And could it still be lurking in the depths today? Other animals survived including crocodiles, the duck-billed platypus, and even bees. There have even been animals that were long thought to be extinct, only to suddenly and mysteriously turn up again, alive and well. One famous example is the coelacanth, a large, ancient fish species thought to have died out with the dinosaurs, but then in 1938, miraculously, living coelacanths were found off the coast of South Africa. Could the same thing 
be happening in Loch Ness? Paleontologist Dr. Pernille Trollson has studied thousands of fossils from museum collections around the world. And she thinks she may have the answer. So the whole group of Plesiosauria is divided into these two morphotypes. One of them is the one we see here. So this is the Pliosaur, and the other ones are the Plesiosaurs. Right away, the parallels to our profile of the Loch Ness Monster seem obvious. So what is really unique about Plesiosaurs is that they have no modern analogs, which means that we have no animal that looks like this today. They have this really unique body plan, which you can see here, the four flippers, and then you have a trunk area, and the neck, the head, and the tail. Is it possible that the Loch Ness Monster skeleton has been here on display for nearly two centuries. Dr. Trollson is a plesiosaur expert, having dedicated her PhD studies to this one specific species. And according to her, the answer is no. Because as we're about to find out, her recently published research proves that despite thousands of eyewitness accounts over hundreds of years, we might have the potential monster's most iconic feature all wrong. It's a groundbreaking new find that could allow us to finally complete our profile of the world's most sought after unknown species. For decades, thousands of dedicated Nessie hunters have focused on a very specific description. A beast with a long serpentine neck reminiscent of ancient plesiosaurs. But plesiosaur specialist, Dr. Pernille Trollson, has a major problem with that theory. She thinks that Nessie hunters should be looking for something significantly different. The plesiosaurs have a great variety of neck lengths. It goes all the way from 16 vertebrae to 76 vertebrae. So that's a, a great deal amount of, of neck vertebrae compared to us as mammals. We only have seven vertebrae in the neck. A plesiosaur's neck ranges from three feet to 23 feet. And while that length adds flexibility, it also creates a major weakness. Dr. Trollson did extensive research on the amount of pressure and movement a plesiosaur neck could take and compared it to what alleged witnesses have said about the Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster depicted with this thin, long neck, like the, the long neck plesiosaurs, would not have been able to, to cross the, the water surface because the pressure on the neck when it was moving out of the water would have been too high and definitely that swan-like pose it's been depicted as would have been impossible. In other words, a flexible plesiosaur neck wouldn't have the strength to stand above the waterline. In fact, it would barely be able to break the surface. The Loch Ness Monster would probably have been another animal uh, than the long neck plesiosaur, similar to this ichthyosaur we see here, which has a really, really short neck that would have been able to cope with the water pressure as the animal would cross the water surface. And that's not the only thing Dr. Trollson found in her research. Another reason why I don't think the Loch Ness Monster would be a plesiosaur is the fact that we, we assume that plesiosaurs were air breathers. Whatever this species is, if it needed to come up for air every few minutes, it would easily be spotted by onlookers. Therefore, the creature most likely has gills. If Dr. Trollson is correct, we've been dead wrong this whole time about a long-necked Loch Ness monster. Even though it was a hoax, modern sightings have clearly been influenced by the iconic 1934 surgeon's photo in the Daily Mail. If not for that photo, the mistaken concept of a long-necked Nessie might never have existed. Without it, is it possible the monster could have been found decades ago? We may never know how much lost time it cost the search.
But we now have all the information we need to complete our new profile of the Loch Ness Monster. So far, we've developed this image. And at last, we have the final piece of the puzzle. If the creature's eel-like serpentine form isn't its neck, then it must be its body. With that last detail, we can finally reveal our brand new, never before seen image of what the Loch Ness Monster might look like. A far cry from the traditional dinosaur-like appearance pitched to tourists over the years. This is what the monster would have to actually resemble in order to survive and thrive while remaining hidden in the waters of Loch Ness. It's still rather terrifying, perhaps even more so. One thing's for sure. If any creature got close enough to witness this detailed point of view, it wouldn't survive long enough to tell the tale. Now that we know what a potential Loch Ness monster might look like, perhaps we can determine the location where the species could be found. We theorized that this is a migratory animal. In other words, it probably hasn't lived in the loch for its entire existence. In order to locate it today, we must answer two key questions. First, how exactly could this creature come and go from Loch Ness? And second, is it still able to do so? Local guide Grant Sutherland has fished the waters around Loch Ness his entire life, and he thinks he knows the route the beast originally took from the North Sea to the loch, a path it may still be traveling today. Having worked in the area for over 20 years, Grant is very familiar with the waterways that surround Loch Ness. According to Grant, there is only one natural link between the North Sea and the Loch, and that's the River Ness. Well, here we are at the mouth of the River Ness. This is where it enters the North Sea. This area is one of the most food-rich environments in all of Scotland, absolutely teeming with fish species. This is a riptide you can see coming out here. This is a bit popular area, lots of food churned up, so there's a lot of fish that are going to be attracted to this area. Humans have been hauling in large catches from the mouth of the River Ness for centuries, but we're not the only ones. A wide array of marine predators feast here too, including birds, seals, and dolphins. So it's possible that a large North Sea marine hunter like the potential Loch Ness Monster could have come here as well. Once it reached the river mouth, two tasty species in particular could have coaxed it even farther. A couple of species, the Atlantic salmon and the sea trout, that will carry on up the river looking for spawning grounds. Brown trout and Atlantic salmon are the two largest and most nutrient-rich fish in the area. If the monster exists, it's easy to imagine it following these fish upstream during a feeding frenzy. But unfortunately, if this alleged animal wanted to make it all the way to Loch Ness from here, it would meet a major obstacle. Here we are, just a mile and a half from the mouth of the river. This is one of the first obstacles that any animal that's wanting to navigate its way through into Loch Ness is going to hit very boldly shallow, fast-flowing water like this, and there's another five to six miles of this. It's going to make it difficult for any animal to navigate its way into the deep waters of Loch Ness. In other words, if the monster wanted to reach the loch by way of the River Ness, this would be the end of the road. Fortunately, there just might be another way in.
Building off our new profile, we now have a compelling theory of the Loch Ness Monster's potential behavior. What if the beast is so elusive because it migrates? Can it come and go from the loch at will? We know the River Ness is too powerful and rocky to be navigable by a large marine animal. But could there be another way? This is a Caledonian Canal, and this is a backdoor into Loch Ness. Completed in 1822, the Caledonian Canal was built as a shortcut across Scotland for commercial boats. It runs from coast to coast, including directly into Loch Ness. 35 feet deep and lacking the powerful current and rapids of the River Ness, the canal would make a much more inviting route for the monster if it exists. The River Ness is a very tough journey for any species to take up there. The Caledonian Canal would be a much easier piece of water for any animal that chose to move from the sea into Loch Ness. It's a much slower, deeper piece of water. The time frame of the canal's construction certainly checks out. The earliest sightings of the monster were in the River Ness, not the loch. It may have had no way to reach the loch at first, but the canal opened in 1822, just 14 years after the Stronse beast was discovered 131 miles away. That massive North Sea species that previously could only travel partway up the river could now make it all the way to Loch Ness. Today, boat traffic regularly commutes through the canal. The question is, could the Loch Ness Monster use the canal the very same way? Coming to its favorite feeding ground during its salmon and trout spawning runs each spring and summer. If the Loch Ness Monster is migrating to chase food, it helps explain some other mysteries. For instance, the inconsistency in its annual appearances. In 1996, there were 17 alleged sightings. But in 2009, and again in 2013, Nessie was supposedly spotted just once the whole year. This seems like good evidence that the species doesn't live here full time. Still, it gives us an advantage. We now know precisely when this species is most likely to be present in these waters. When the salmon begin to migrate into the loch, the creature known as Nessie could be close behind. And if we're right, then that time is now. This year's salmon migration began two weeks ago. So armed with our new profile, the hunt for this unidentified creature is officially on. It will be a two-pronged search effort, led by Captain Mike Lynch and scuba diver Chris McKendry. Captain Mike will be manning the Rebel, a 40-foot catamaran outfitted with state-of-the-art sonar that will give him a never-before-seen picture of the murky lock bottom. I'm gonna play Nessie. <laughs> Working in tandem with the Rebel, aboard a high-speed Zodiac, is Chris and a two-man dive team. Advanced cold water divers Tom Fian and Ken Miller will be ready to enter the water at the captain's signal. As soon as we're ready and we see something on the screen that we feel the need to investigate, then the dive team in the rib there can launch at very short notice. OK. Just go into lock end uh, as close as we can. Obviously, you can go further to the shore than I can. Yeah, no problem. This is the mouth of the lock. Lock end to the right there. We've just entered Loch Ness now. Weather conditions are pretty good. We've got a slight mist there, but there's very little wind. And these are the ideal conditions now. Captain Mike is using our newfound understanding of the potential monster's migratory habits to focus his search on the north end of the loch, where the salmon-rich River Ness 
intersects with a Caledonian canal. Loch Ness is a vast area. Uh, the monster Nessie could be swimming anywhere under there, but I think there's more fish up this end of the loch because of the, the salmon and that swimming through. As Mike pilots the rebel, his fellow skipper Andrew monitors the sonar information on a large screen below deck. I'll come around port side. Yeah, go around port side. That's a good shot, Mike. The rebel sonar boasts unparalleled range and resolution. Sonars have developed such a long way now. We've got a lot more detail on the uh, the sonars. You can see that we can detail even the fish on the sonars now. So technology's moved on and it's given us more sophisticated equipment. In addition to the latest technology, we also have a much clearer picture of exactly what we're looking for and where it might be found. We're not necessarily looking for a big long neck, lots of humps. What we're probably looking for is an apex predator. And because we know we're looking for that, we can narrow down the searches to what apex predators feed on. Captain Mike sweeps back and forth in tight parallel lines, like a lawnmower cutting a yard. Yeah, you're picking that up now, Ant. Yeah, perfect. Just go around it, just say about six, seven knots be perfect. The Rebel is now passing over a steep underwater ledge, which could be an area of particular interest in our search. We're now heading south down Loch Ness. We've just left behind us Loch End, the small village there. Now, at Loch End, the uh, Loch Ness is very shallow, but then it suddenly slopes off, and we're now recording a, f a depth of 258 feet. And you can see on the sonar there that there's two sets or two shoals of fish there. Now, where there's lots of fish, obviously, that means that that's a food source. So, obviously, Nessie needs to feed. And that would be ideal feed for Nessie there. As the boat moves over the shoals of fish, the captain notices something new on the sonar. Looking at the sonar there on the, uh, the LED, I can see some dark spots appearing with the multi-beam there. We're not too sure what those dark spots are, so we need to just go back and take a closer look at that, hover over that. But we need to investigate a little bit further. Armed with our new profile of the Loch Ness Monster and a detailed analysis of its possible migratory habits, we've zeroed in on the precise time and place we're most likely to find this unidentified species. We've got the very precise sonar technology now that will give us a 3D map of the, uh, the lock itself. That's given us more detailed advantage than we've ever had before uh, on board this vessel. The sonar has pinpointed several shoals of fish. So they're currently swimming at a depth of about 193 feet. And nearby, it spotted something else as well, a reading unlike anything the crew has ever seen. Skipper Mike, we just take her around to the port side a bit, we'll get a better view. Roger, that's next, Sandy. This dark blue area here, we don't currently have any information on. So we need to get the skipper to go over this area a few times to help enhance the 3D image. Captain Mike steers back over the dark area on the lock bottom, using a more precise multi-beam sonar to try to generate a clearer picture. He asks Andrew to put the dive team on standby. OK, OK. So the divers are going to get ready. We're going to go on standby. The divers have got the dry suits on, the undersuits, the dry suits. That's going to help protect them against the elements. This lock is really, really cold. If you're in there without a dry suit, you could be dead within minutes. So the divers have got to be very careful about making sure their suits are all ready. They're all zipped up, good to go. The speed is of the essence. We need to get geared up quick. We need to get in the water quick. Get right down on that contact as soon as we can. Now. It's up to the crew on the Rebel to try and identify this mysterious mass as quickly as possible. I can park 
the boat just over this dark area to get more detailed information, which is what we'll do now. Skipper crew? Yeah, mate, you able to go a bit more starboard and a little bit slower. OK, cheers. Unfortunately, the technique doesn't work, because whatever this dark form is, it's on the move. This needs further investigation, and we may have to get the dive team into this just to check it out. Now we're almost directly over this area that's brought our attention. The multi-beam has shown something. We're not sure what it is, but I think it's time we get the divers down for a closer look. Just waiting for confirmation just now. Once we get that confirmation, get the location, uh, we're going to send the divers in to have a look around. I think we need to investigate. Go, go, guys, let's go. Straight the way down here. Get the divers in now, guys, let's go. And I'll move the boat now out of the way. It's directly under the boat where we are. OK, guys, it's all clear now. Already on the count of three. One, two, three, go. On the northern end of Loch Ness, Captain Mike Lynch has spotted an anomaly on his sonar, a dark form near several shoals of fish that very well might be a sign of the elusive monster. Whatever it is, the anomaly is on the move. So the captain has quickly made the call to deploy the dive team before it can escape. Already on the count of three. One. Two, three, go. Good. All right. Well done, guys. I said connected good. The water is thick with mud and debris. It also filters out more and more sunlight with each foot the divers descend. They're a bit deeper. We've passed that point where I can't see them anymore. They're pretty deep now. It's pretty dark and murky down there. The divers have reached the upper level of the rock shelf that the Rebels' equipment spotted from above. The shoals of fish that initially drew attention to the area have scattered. Perhaps scared away, but by what? Tom is now searching for anything that could have created the massive unknown object on the sonar. We're close to getting what we feel could be a sighting. Um, and that really is an experience in itself. Remember, this goes back hundreds of years, and we're on the edge of maybe finding something. Despite conditions that get darker, colder, and more dangerous with every inch of depth, the team decides to keep going. With no sonar picture of what lies beneath them, they are diving blind. This is a very dangerous time for divers. They need to monitor their air, make sure they've got enough air to stay at that depth, to try and find that contact, but also to make it safely back up to the surface. That's key, that's the important thing. At this depth, the visibility is so bad, Tom's flashlight provides less than five feet of illumination. And the water temperature has plunged below 40 degrees. 
what we're looking for, the signal to the surface, is an SMB, a surface marker boy. That's going to let us know if they've made contact. The divers have encountered something massive. As you can see, a large animal with a vertical tail fin passed directly in front of the camera, knocking it aside and kicking up a large cloud of sand and debris. As the cloud subsides, the creature has disappeared into the darkness. Tom and Ken would prefer to continue their investigation. But over 150 feet down, and with their oxygen tanks running low, they must return to the surface. Tom prepares to send up the surface marker buoy to let Chris know the location of their contact. That's the SMB up. The divers slowly and carefully make their ascent. So divers have definitely seen something. They've definitely made some sort of contact. It's just hard to tell what it is right now. And that's them coming up. They're almost at the surface. So what did you guys see? There was some massive in there. Kicked up a lot of salt. Time to get back to it. Hit, move far too quick, move the fast into deeper water. This could be the first time ever that a diver has not only spotted the creature long identified as the Loch Ness Monster, but actually made physical contact with it. As the day comes to an end, the dive team and the crew of the Rebel know that they've been a part of history. OK, I received that. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, it looks very promising. It, it feels as though they've found something down there that's worth further investigation. So talking to the divers there, and uh, yeah, we were so close this time, and at least we've got a good idea now of where to look for the next time. We'll keep trying. We're closer than ever before. Well done, Ant. Well done, Mike. This is about the closest I think anybody's ever come to exactly, finding mate. it. Yeah. Well done. Fantastic, yeah. I'm really excited for this one here. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Really good. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. Oh, Messi, here we come. <laughs> Our experience tonight shows just how difficult the search for the Loch Ness Monster can be. Despite years of research and months of planning, all we could get was a fleeting encounter. And yet, that may be closer than anyone else has ever come. At the very least, we've identified a new approach in finding the beast based on scientific logic. As many as 18,000 new species are discovered every year. That means four new ones might have been found in the time you've been watching this program. There's a chance we've identified something new tonight. We may have even seen it. No matter what, we've certainly added to the rich history of this legendary creature. From St. Columba in the year 565, to Alex Campbell in 1933, to Gordon Holmes in 2007, to us here today, one thing is clear. Something is out there. There's only one way to find out what the Loch Ness Monster truly is, and that's to keep looking. The search continues. The Bible is the world's most popular book and the backbone of its largest religion. Somehow, despite the efforts of billions of people who have studied its text, these pages contain several of mankind's greatest unsolved mysteries. Tonight, we take on two of the Bible's most famous legends, 
iconic treasures thought to bring untold wealth to anyone who can find them today. King Solomon's Mines and the Ark of the Covenant. Do they actually exist? Can they still be found? Or have they already been discovered? To find out, we'll search through time and across continents, tracking a surprising relationship between these two priceless mysteries. And by the end, we may finally pinpoint their true locations as we go in search of the secrets of the Bible. The Bible isn't just one book. Depending on which branch of Christianity you follow, it's upwards of 70 books written by thousands of authors over the course of 1400 years. Its New Testament is famous for the Gospels of Jesus, and its Old Testament features the creation of the universe, the exodus from Egypt, and tales of the early kings of the Israelites, the most successful of whom was the famed King Solomon. According to the Bible, Solomon was born in Jerusalem and ascended to power during the 10th century BCE. As a leader, he expanded Israel's trade and military strength, founded numerous colonies, and built the first Hebrew temple in Jerusalem. Solomon was famous for his wisdom, said to be a gift from God. His proverbs feature heavily in several religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But he was famous for something else, too, his incredible wealth, thanks to the legendary King Solomon's Mines. For centuries, many have speculated that Solomon had access to a near unlimited supply of precious metals from a secret underground mine. But unfortunately for those would-be treasure hunters, its location has been lost to history. The search for the mine has inspired several books and movies, with tales of Solomon's bounty hidden as far away as the Americas. But in reality, it's more likely to be found closer to Solomon's biblical home, specifically within the kingdom of the Israelites. And here, less than 200 miles south of Jerusalem, archeologists Erez Ben Yosef and Vanessa Workman believe they might have uncovered the true location of King Solomon's mines. The Timna Valley is rich in minerals that have been mined since ancient times. But they're not the minerals you might expect. While many people believed that gold was the resource in Timna, what we see here is a remnant of a vein of copper. In Israel and all the neighboring areas, we don't have any gold. Gold as a metal is very soft. You can't uh, use it for tools and things like that. We know today that copper was the most important resource, the most important metal in the ancient world. It was made into objects that were useful in both agriculture and weaponry, and also to be used to help build in the period. Erez's team of archaeologists has been digging here in Timna for the past 10 years, trying to unravel the truth behind who controlled these colossal mines. Exploring the ancient mines of Timna, we are asking questions about who were conducting all of this mining operation, which society, in which periods, the chronology, the technology, the culture, the trade connections, all of these aspects of this huge operation. Archaeologists have long debated which kingdom owned and operated these mines, with most agreeing that it couldn't have been Solomon's. Previous activity in Timna dated this major period to the Egyptian dynasties in the 13th century BCE. But is it possible the experts have been wrong all along? Written evidence provides an interesting link between King Solomon and copper. According to the biblical text, copper was used to furnish and help build Solomon's temple. 
They were building the pillars of the temple, they were covering the walls and other things in the temple with vast quantities of copper. In the time of King Solomon, whoever had copper had power. It's like oil of today. And these mines were one of the sources of that power. Based on extensive biblical evidence, Erez was convinced that Solomon had a copper mine in his kingdom. But now he had to prove it. Step one was to analyze the tools the miners used. You can see very nicely the chisel marks. What you can see here is evidence of mining underground with metal tools. And these chisel marks are 3,000 years old. Unfortunately, both the Egyptians and the Israelites used similar tools. So while these marks could mean this was Solomon's mine, they still weren't definitive proof. But Erez and Vanessa had one more place to look. The mining tunnels were only one part of this massive ancient operation. Our real information for understanding the activity of this period comes from the smelting camps. After it was mined, the extracted copper then had to go through a smelting process, which involves heating the raw ore to extract the base metal within. Once the copper is removed, the excess rock is discarded as a hardened black material called slag. In order to find the smelting camps, Erez and Vanessa searched the Timna Valley for slag. Soon enough, they found precisely what they were looking for. On this hill itself, we have more than 1,000 tons of copper slag, which tells us about 100 tons of copper produced over about a century. This is one of the largest copper smelting camps of ancient times. Once they found it, the archaeologists next tried to determine its layout. Because copper was one of the most valuable resources in the ancient world, it had to be protected. This means that they built a defense system around the smelting camps to keep people out. There was only one access point into the site, at the pathway that leads up to the top. It still wasn't enough evidence to prove who built the camp. But the picture of this ancient mining operation was definitely getting clearer. The wall and the location of the site are indeed evidence for the need of defense and protection of this valuable material. But also, they protected the secret of making stone into metal. The knowledge itself was a commodity. The technology used in the smelting camps 3,000 years ago is impressive for us today. And despite years and years of research, we're still piecing together exactly what this real ancient recipe was, which at that time was considered magic. Clearly, the copper industry in Timna was well organized. But the question remains, who was in charge of its organization? Was it the Egyptians, as historians have long believed? Or could it possibly have been King Solomon? Just a few months ago, Erez and Vanessa made an incredible discovery amongst the tons of leftover slag the miners left behind. With the date. That's amazing. I think it's the first one. Yeah. I need a special bag over here. This new information could blow the long-sought secret of King Solomon's mines wide open. It's crazy, but this might be the event that we are looking for. For centuries, treasure seekers have pursued the famed King Solomon's mines. But as it turns out, if they exist, they may have been hiding in plain sight in a location that's been misunderstood for decades. This area is full of stuff. Just a few months ago, in Israel's Timna Valley, archaeologists made a shocking discovery while excavating the region's ancient copper mines. I, I, this is rare. Oh, here you can see it. It's a finding that could rewrite the history of this well-known legend. When Dr. Erez Ben Yosef first arrived to the Timna Valley 10 years ago, the area's copper mines were already well known. In fact, many believed there was nothing new to be found. 
it was commonly accepted that due to the mind's sophistication, they must have belonged to ancient Egypt. Unwilling to accept that as a foregone conclusion, Dr. Ben Yosef's team kept digging, and what they discovered was phenomenal. They discovered hundreds of remnants of the ancient copper workers, seeds and bones from their meals, and even parts of their clothing, all perfectly preserved due to the area's dry climate. These items were so well preserved, in fact, that they could still be carbon dated. The mystery of when these mines were in operation and therefore who controlled them was about to be solved. The team's findings were sent to a lab to determine if these mines truly were Egyptian or if they could have belonged to someone else. And only when the date came back from the lab, we were amazed because not a single date fit to the New Kingdom of Egypt. So of course we sent more and more samples and the results are clear. All the dates concentrated around the 10th century BC. The most intense time of production here was at the time of King Solomon. For decades, we've wondered what could have been the source of wealth of this small kingdom in Jerusalem that controlled a huge area according to the Hebrew Bible. And now with this discovery, we suddenly have an amazing source of wealth that can explain the power of King Solomon. This is an incredible find that will force people to rethink history. To me, it's clear that if there were mines of King Solomon, they were of copper and they were here. If these Timna Valley copper mines did in fact belong to King Solomon, it goes a long way toward proving the Bible's claims of his unimaginable wealth. But one crucial detail is still missing. Where did his gold come from? 1 Kings chapter 10 of the Bible states, the weight of the gold which Solomon received each year was 666 talents. Converted into today's measurements, that's approximately 25 tons of gold for each year of his 40-year reign. To put that into perspective, the Bible says that King Solomon had more than double the amount of the U.S. gold bullion deposits currently held in the New York Federal Reserve. Nowhere within the kingdom of the Israelites can that incredible volume of gold be found. Therefore, we can only reach one conclusion. While the kingdom may have had a lucrative copper mine within its territory, the gold must have been brought in from outside. Fortunately, the Bible gives us a clue about who might have transported it and where it originated. According to the Bible, Solomon expanded his kingdom from the southern border with Egypt all the way to Syria, putting him in a position to control merchants and freight carriers between Africa, Europe, and Asia. But only one nearby group had ships large enough to carry massive quantities of gold the Phoenicians. The Bible describes a clear connection between Solomon and the Phoenician king Hiram. Solomon gave the Phoenicians grain supplies, and in return, according to the Book of Kings, Hiram sent his men to Ophir and brought back 420 talents of gold, which they delivered to Solomon. Is it possible that if we head to Ophir, we might find the source of Solomon's gold. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly where Ophir was. Historians have speculated that it could have been somewhere in the Middle East, Africa, or Asia, but its exact location has remained a mystery. A mystery that may have recently been solved by an historian in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. In the Bible, the land of Ophir is known as the land of gold. Ethiopia means the land of the yellowish gold. And the majority of gold is found here in Tigray. We think that gold from the Bible is from here.
situated in the far north of the country. Ethiopia's Tigray region is a very likely candidate for the location of Ophir. Because not only is the land rich in gold, but it also has a surprising connection to King Solomon. At the time of Solomon's reign, this area was possibly controlled by another famous biblical figure, the Queen of Sheba. And what's more, according to the Bible, she and Solomon were quite close with one another. The second book of Chronicles states that early in Solomon's reign, the queen visited Jerusalem to seek out his famous wisdom. And she didn't come empty-handed. Her gifts included 120 talents of gold, around four tons of it, from her kingdom's mines. The queen and Solomon had a love affair, resulting in the birth of a son, forever uniting these two kingdoms. But the gold Sheba brought to Solomon was just the tip of the iceberg. She may have possessed some of the oldest and most famous gold mines in recorded history. There's a chance those gold reserves still exist today in a remote area just 40 miles from where Sheba's palace once stood. All this land where I'm standing is full of gold, and the search continues today. While the exact location of the ancient gold mines has remained a mystery, there are still trace deposits at the surface. To find them, locals extract earth from the banks of the river filling their buckets with sediment. Then they take that sediment down to the water for sifting. If we're close enough to the potential source of the Queen of Sheba's gold, the proof will be in this pan. Oh, wow. look at that. The search for King Solomon's mines has taken us out of Israel and into northern Ethiopia. There's a chance that this could be the source of King Solomon's gold from ancient mines controlled by his closest ally, the Queen of Sheba. By panning for trace deposits of gold near the surface, locals in this area hope to pinpoint the source of Sheba's treasure. And it appears they're on the right track. Look at that. We found gold. With this much gold close to the surface, there is almost certainly a much larger vein nearby. But finding it requires a major excavation. This stairs lead us to a network of hidden tunnels deep underground. These tunnels are located near a high concentration of surface gold deposits and date to what the Bible describes as the time of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. They have only recently been rediscovered and the careful work of exploring them has barely begun. Some historians, including Sise, believe they could lead directly into Sheba's mines. If so, we may be standing closer than ever before to the source of King Solomon's gold. With excavation continuing in Ethiopia, one of the Bible's greatest mysteries, the true location of King Solomon's mines, seems on the verge of being solved. But Solomon left behind one other incredible treasure that may be even more valuable than all of his or Sheba's gold. At the height of his power, Solomon's crowning achievement was the construction of the first Hebrew temple. He built it here on Jerusalem's Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock sits today. In Solomon's time, it looked like this. 
one of the greatest buildings of the era. Adorned in copper and gold, a majestic structure designed for an important purpose. This was where Solomon kept the most powerful object the Israelites possessed, the Ark of the Covenant. Much like the location of King Solomon's mines, this iconic biblical artifact has long been lost. But a new theory is emerging, one that suggests the mines, the gold, the Queen of Sheba, and the Ark of the Covenant might be connected. And this connection could potentially lead us to the Ark's present day location. According to the Bible's book of Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant was built to house the tablets of the Ten Commandments. It was made of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half wide, and one and a half high, or in today's measurements, 52 inches by 31 by 31. The entire chest was plated with gold, inside and out. Four gold rings were attached to its corners, where gold-plated wood poles could be inserted to carry the ark. The lid was also gold, adorned with two winged cherubs. But it's not just the precious metals and craftsmanship that make it valuable, because the ark was also thought to be a powerful weapon. According to one biblical story, the ark was once stolen by a tribe called the Philistines, who were immediately afflicted by misfortunes including tumors, boils, and a plague of mice. Their torment only stopped once they returned the Ark to the Israelites. Eventually, King David brought it to Jerusalem where his son, King Solomon, installed it in the temple. From there, the mystery begins. The first Hebrew temple was destroyed in a war with the Babylonians 2,700 years ago. But there's no record of the Ark among the spoils. It's unusual for such a valuable treasure to go completely unaccounted for. The question is, could the Ark have been moved before the Babylonians arrived? If so, where and when? One large group of believers over 1,200 miles from Jerusalem is convinced that the Ark ended up in their territory, perhaps even during King Solomon's reign. It may be an unlikely story until you realize they live in a place we've already visited. Ever since the destruction of King Solomon's famed temple in Jerusalem, its greatest treasure, the Ark of the Covenant, has been missing. But some believe that the Ark may have been moved long before the temple fell, to the home of one of Solomon's most valuable allies, the Queen of Sheba. According to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, when Solomon and Sheba's son, Menelik, came of age, he returned to Jerusalem to visit his father. Solomon tried to persuade Menelik to stay and become his heir, but the young prince returned to Ethiopia as his mother's heir instead. When he arrived back home, Menelik made a shocking discovery. There among his possessions was the Ark of the Covenant, which unbeknownst to him, had been secretly taken from Israel by members of his entourage. But despite the Ark's power, Menelik's people suffered no plagues, leading them to assume they must be its rightful owners. The Solomonic dynasty ruled over Ethiopia for over 2,000 years. And Ethiopian Orthodox scholars like Dr. Solomon Gatane believe the Ark has remained in the country to this day. This ceremony has never been filmed for television before. In the Ethiopian town of Aksum, 
worshipers have gathered for an early morning mass. The focus of today's sermon is the Ark of the Covenant. We have seen this morning the gathering of people for prayer. Now, this is a unique opportunity to see the Ark of the Covenant out of the altar. Just 20 miles from the Eritrean border, Aksum is home to the Cathedral of Our Lady Mary of Zion, which sits on the holiest ground in all of Ethiopian Orthodoxy. This is the most holy church for the Ethiopian Orthodox religion. Every year, thousands of people make a pilgrimage here to commemorate the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant to Aksum from Jerusalem. While there are many Christian denominations, only this one has based its beliefs so intently around the possession of the Ark. Every Ethiopian Orthodox Church worldwide contains a replica of the Ark inside its own Holy of Holies. It is instructed a replica must be in the church. Without having a replica, the building cannot be called a church. At the same time, a replica is a center of the worship. And in fact, the Ark at the center of today's ceremony is also a replica. Even the replicas are thought to have tremendous power and are rarely brought into public view. But what about the real Ark of the Covenant? If it truly exists and the Ethiopians still possess it, where can it be found? The Ark is thought to be too powerful to reside in the main church so a secure building was constructed to house it deep underground. And that building is here, just 100 yards away. Can you imagine right behind me the 5,000-year-old Ark of the Covenant with a tablet, the same Ark from the Temple of Solomon? Unfortunately, the true Ark is off-limits to visitors, and actually, it can only be viewed by one man, the guardian monk. According to tradition, the Ark's guardian monk is chosen by divine prophecy. Once appointed, the guardian lives inside the chapel and protects the Ark for the rest of his life. The current guardian has held his post for nearly 50 years and is almost never seen. He usually stays inside praying and protecting the most valuable nucleus of the church. He's out. He's Look. Oh, he's out. Yeah, yeah, it's outside. This is a rare occasion. The guardian is outside. I am going to try to talk to him. <laughs> this is one of the first times that a current guardian monk has ever been photographed. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance that few believers will ever get to experience. Normally, the guardian don't talk to uh, anyone, but uh, I got a rare opportunity. He asked me what people saying about the true Ark of the Covenant. Then I told him that some of them say that it's not in Ethiopia. He said the Ark is here. The Ark of the true Ark of the Covenant is here. For now, that confirmation will have to be enough. I believe earlier, I believe now and forever. But it gives me a great, great pleasure talking to the guardian monk. He blessed me by the hand that he touched the true Ark of the Covenant. So I'm extremely happy. Is it possible that the true Ark of the Covenant was removed from Israel and has remained here for thousands of years? For the nearly 50 million members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, there is no question that the answer is yes. Meanwhile, historians, other religious groups, archaeologists, and even the Nazi party have continued to search for the Ark. 
Many of them believe it never left Israel in the first place, but all agree that it somehow escaped the temple's destruction. If the Israelites did manage to save the Ark in the midst of a war, archaeologist Harry Moskov believes he knows precisely how they pulled it off. Right now we're on the southern slope of the Temple Mount. This is the holiest spot on earth. Just beyond this wall is where the Holy of Holies, King Solomon's Temple, and the Ark of the Covenant stood. When the temple was destroyed, the Ark disappeared. Many people believe that the Ark may have been destroyed or lost, but I'm here to tell you that in fact the Ark still exists even till today and is not far from here. If the Ark truly remains in Israel, the question is, how did it escape before the temple's destruction? According to Harry, there is only one possible answer. There are over 35 acres of tunnels underneath the Temple Mount. And many of them lead out of Jerusalem. According to my research, the ancient Israelites in the times of the first temple may have used this tunnel system to hide the Ark of the Covenant before the destruction in 586 BC. If Harry's theory is correct, we now have an incredible opportunity to track the Ark. Because even though access to the tunnels is highly restricted, with Harry's help, we can enter these 3,000-year-old passages and see them for ourselves. Where I'm taking you now is the original tunnel system. Now this tunnel is really the closest point that we have to actually getting to the chamber of the Ark of the Covenant. It's down here, it's underneath this. Many religious sources agree that the Ark of the Covenant once sat securely in King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. But when that temple was destroyed, the Ark may have been saved by way of a network of secret tunnels beneath the city. There are over 50 tunnels under the Temple Mount, many of them dating all the way back to King Solomon's day. We know that in King Solomon's time, in the time of the first temple, the Ark of the Covenant was held in the Holy of Holies chamber directly above us. Everything started right here. King Solomon, in his great wisdom, knew that he might need an escape route. He used these tunnels as an insurance plan in case the temple would come under attack. Just as Solomon predicted, the attack came from the Babylonians, who completely destroyed the temple. But by then, the Ark may have been long gone. There's a story that says a thousand priests were able to escape with the temple vessels, and you can easily imagine the priests rushing these temple vessels out of these tunnels for safekeeping. Follow the tunnels, and we could locate the final resting place of the Ark and all the rest of the temple's treasures. So if you connect the dots, what you have is a direct path from the Holy of Holies directly above us with the Ark of the Covenant in it in the first temple down straight to the chamber where the Ark was kept through these tunnels and onward 18 miles all the way to the plains of Jericho to Qumran. I've been working for over 20 years to find the Ark of the Covenant and I believe we're closer than ever before to finding it. But the Ark is very powerful. It is the most powerful object in the history of mankind and will only be found under the right conditions when it's ready. Those perfect conditions may soon be upon us. Because in the plains of Jericho, precisely where the tunnels lead, treasure hunter Jim Barfield thinks he may have found the perfect hiding spot along with an ancient treasure map that could lead us directly to the Ark of the Covenant. These are the ancient ruins of the community of Qumran. They're most famous because this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient Jewish religious texts, some up to 2,500 years old. They were buried here in caves 
and only rediscovered in the 1940s. But then, in 1952, one more scroll was found, unlike any of the others. It's different in two ways. First, it's material, not written on parchment, but hammered into precious copper. And second, it's content. It doesn't contain scripture. It contains something far more valuable. The Copper Scroll is kind of like a treasure map, listing the locations of the treasures of ancient Israel, including the Ark of the Covenant. For the first time in history, Jim has combined the Copper Scroll's instructions with geological surveys and scientific data to zero in on the potential location of the buried treasure. Location number one on the Copper Scroll it describes 17 talents of silver service vessels from the Temple of Solomon. And the Copper Scroll says that they are located at the steps heading east, 40 cubits long. Jim's survey showed only one location with steps heading east. When he measured them, he knew he was on the right track. These steps are exactly 40 cubits long, heading east, I am convinced those 17 talents of silver service vessels are right here under this ground. Jim is currently lobbying the Israeli government for permission to excavate. But according to him, there's far more to uncover than just 17 talents of silver. His map may lead to even greater treasures, including the Ark of the Covenant. Is it possible that the Ark of the Covenant was secretly rushed from the first Hebrew temple in Jerusalem just before the temple's destruction? Treasure hunter Jim Barfield believes the answer is yes. He has decoded an ancient treasure map, hammered into a copper scroll thousands of years old, which lists the supposed locations of the most valuable artifacts from the temple. According to Jim, they can all be found in the ancient city of Qumran. The second location on the Copper Scroll was surprisingly easy to find, considering the value of what's buried right here. The Copper Scrolls describe this location like this. In the dry cistern, the great ruined courtyard of the peristyle is hidden polished gold. In front of the uppermost opening are 900 talents. That is 33 tons of polished gold at this location. Armed with a survey of Qumran, Jim was quickly able to locate the town's cistern. I came out here with a member of the Israeli parliament and a very powerful metal detector. And when we got to this spot, the readings were off the charts. I could not believe what I saw. I went home and I buried 30 pounds of silver in my front yard, and the readings didn't even come close. But the gold was never Jim's primary target. It's just one more clue that could lead to the greatest prize of all. Location number one, location number two, lined up perfectly with my map. But my ultimate goal is to find location number three which includes the temple vessels and the Ark of the Covenant. The Copper Scroll describes this location as being at the north end of the Hill of Kolit. It couldn't be within the ruins of Qumran because there are no hills there. While Qumran sits on flatland, there are several large hills nearby. Jim studied dozens of satellite images to find one that matched the Copper Scroll's description. It's right here. Not only does this hill feature a hidden cave, it also sits in perfect alignment with the other temple treasures. Take location number one, location number two, and you connect them with a straight line. They will lead directly to this cave that holds Israel's most important treasures, including the Ark of the Covenant. Jeremiah brought the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle of Moses, and buried them inside of a cave and sealed the entrance. When I got to the cave, some of the stones looked different than the rest. It appears that an ancient trowel of some type was used to form this seal. 
I took a sample of this stone to two different companies. They said it was an ancient, man-made mortar, unlike any natural formation. It's clear that whoever sealed this cave went to great lengths to hide its contents. Could those contents include the Ark of the Covenant? After we identified this as the most likely site of the cave, we came back with the high-powered metal detector. When we saw the readings for this location, we knew that this was the mother load. The metal detector readings at the cave are five times higher than the 33 tons of gold at site number two, suggesting an even greater prize could indeed be hidden here. It's obvious that something's here. The Copper Scroll, the map, the mortar, and the readings of the metal detector. All of these leave me with no doubt. In this cave are some of Israel's greatest treasures, including the Ark of the Covenant. If Jim Barfield can get permission to dig at Qumran, there's a chance he might be about to finally unearth the Ark of the Covenant. Looking forward, there's no telling where the hunt for the Ark might go. But looking backward, it all leads to one man, a man who simultaneously held two of the Bible's most famed and mysterious treasures. If he existed, King Solomon was quite possibly the most powerful person to ever live. From his lucrative copper mines in Israel to his massive gold reserves imported from abroad, he controlled the area's trade routes and united his kingdom with another regional superpower. He accomplished all of this while in possession of the Ark of the Covenant. But as Solomon reached old age and reflected on his life, he wrote a telling line in the book of Ecclesiastes. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Perhaps the old king had realized that history's ultimate accumulation of wealth and power still wasn't enough to provide fulfillment. It's a lesson that future generations of biblical treasure hunters would be wise to keep in mind. The search continues. It is one of the greatest mysteries in all of American history. Today, the Outer Banks of North Carolina are an inviting tourist destination. But 400 years ago, they were quite the opposite. In 1587, over 100 colonists attempted to build the first permanent English settlement in North America on the eight mile long Roanoke Island. But just three years later, they had all vanished without a trace. To this day, no one knows what happened. Tonight, we head straight to the source and hunt for clues where the colony once stood. We'll reveal a hidden map and a secret message the lost settlers left behind, allowing us to track their possible escape route. And we'll conduct brand new DNA testing that may determine once and for all if there were any survivors. As we go in search of the lost colony of Roanoke. From an early age, we've all been told about the Pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock and the Jamestown settlement in Virginia two of America's most famous founding colonies. But what do you know about the one that came before? Chances are, not much. In fact, there's very little known about that first settlement. That's why they call it the Lost Colony of Roanoke. In 1587, famed English politician Sir Walter Raleigh sponsored an expedition to the New World. On board, approximately 116 colonists, men, women, and children, led by Governor John White. They arrived here, 
Roanoke Island, off the coast of present-day North Carolina, where they built a small town full of carefully constructed houses. Soon after, Governor White returned to England for supplies, leaving behind his friends and family. When he returned just three years later, everyone was gone, and the houses were completely dismantled. The mystery of what happened to them has remained unsolved for over 400 years. But as we're about to find out, that's just one of many mysteries surrounding this incredible, doomed colony. Author Andy Gabriel Powell has spent over a decade researching the lost colony of Roanoke. Today, he's taking us to the northern end of Roanoke Island, the place where it all started in 1587, at the end of an incredible 4,000-mile journey. This is a ship that's typical of what the lost colonists would have sailed on. It's a 50-ton bark. It's one of the Queen's ships, we can tell, because of the flag on the stern here. Desperate for a better life than they had in England, the Roanoke colonists spent 76 days crossing the Atlantic, stuck below decks for most of the trip. But the voyage wasn't entirely uneventful. There was one moment of intrigue along the way, the first of many mysteries to come. Now, rather intriguingly, they were supposed to be going to Chesapeake Bay, but Simon Fernando, the pilot, claimed that he'd run out of time and he essentially marooned them here on Roanoke rather than take them to Chesapeake Bay. In other words, the colonists never intended to be on Roanoke in the first place. And according to Andy, this means they were doomed from the start. If the colony had made it to Chesapeake Bay, I think there's every prospect they would have survived. There would have been a resupply voyage in 1588. The Indians were considerably more friendly. There was far more natural resources available. But instead, they were stranded on Roanoke. The colonists had no choice but to try and make things work. From here, the next mystery unfolds. The precise site of the Roanoke colony has never been identified. But according to park ranger Josh Nelson, it must be nearby. When the colonists arrived in 1587, they're setting foot onto Roanoke Island, and they're seeing much as we do today. It's forested, it's, it's fairly dense woods. They describe it as being on the north end of Roanoke Island, probably close to where we stand today. There is only one surviving account of the colony's location, Governor John White's diary. He says they built their houses on a hilled embankment, surrounding them with a wooden palisade for protection. Is it possible that this is where they started their new lives? One new life started almost immediately, courtesy of John White's pregnant daughter, Eleanor. They're one of the more prominent families to travel on this expedition. And when they arrive on Roanoke Island, they go down in history as uh, having the first English child born in North America. Uh, and that, that child's name is Virginia Dare. But the happy times wouldn't last long. While the colony's first summer was fairly successful, they soon realized that they were ill-equipped to continue to survive on Roanoke. This group would need more people, and they felt like they needed more supplies to be able to make this a lasting colony. Originally, somebody else was going, and the, the whole colony steps forward and says, no, John, you, you need to leave yourself. In August of 1587, John White sailed for England, leaving the colonists without an experienced leader. He hoped to be back in just a few months, but once again, 
the odds would stack even higher against the colonists. Just before his arrival, Queen Elizabeth I has commanded that all ships are to remain in English ports. She's feeling the, the threat of Spanish invasion at that point. And what that does is it basically traps John White, and it takes three years before he can finally come over and try to locate this group of people that he left behind. And now we've reached the biggest mystery of all. In 1590, John White describes coming back to Roanoke Island. It's been three years since leaving the colony. He steps foot on shore. He talks about walking up a sandy embankment, something like this right here. He walks up to the top and he describes seeing a tree that the bark has been peeled off of and the letters CRO have been carved upon it. According to his journals, White continues on to the settlement and there, he finds nothing at all. His daughter and granddaughter are missing. In fact, there are no people and no houses. What remains is the wooden palisade that they built, and of course, the CRO carving that was found. What could this cryptic message possibly mean? For John White at the time, he, he is pretty clear in his journal that he knows where that's pointing him to. White believed the carving referred to an island to the south called Croatoan, inhabited by a Native American tribe of the same name. Were the colonists attacked by the Croatoan tribe? John White was desperate to find out. But in one final cruel twist of fate, White's hopes of finding them were forever dashed. The problem is, when he goes back to the vessel, bad weather's coming up. Winds continue to push them farther away from Roanoke. Eventually, it's too late in the year. They are too far away to be able to return. And so that's the, the only opportunity that John White had to try to locate not only his colony, but also his family that had been left behind. But what seems like the end of the story is really just the beginning. While each mystery may be unsolvable individually, they all boil down to the same question. Where did the lost colonists end up? For over 400 years, historians have tried to find the answer with precious few results. But as we're about to find out, that might all be about to change, thanks to a shocking new theory that could finally lead us in the right direction. It turns out we may have been looking for the lost colony in the wrong place this whole time. What happened to the lost colony of Roanoke in 1590? Three years prior, the colonists seemed off to a good start in their new home. But when their governor returned from a resupply mission to England, everyone was gone. But what if they left behind more clues than we realized? In fact, what if we've been looking in the wrong place this whole time. Anne Poole runs an archeological and historical society called the Lost Colony Research Group. And she thinks the settlers may have built their home in an entirely different area. I've been searching for the Lost Colony ever since I was 10 years old and I'm going on 72 now. According to Anne, in 1587, the shoreline on Roanoke Island was quite different. It may have extended over half a mile farther east, but 400 years of erosion have washed it away. And if that's the case, experts may have the location of the original settlement all wrong. Today, Anne and her team hope to prove this theory by conducting a systematic underwater dig. Well, what we're doing is we've got screens that we sift the, the sand in. We've got shovels. We can just bring up a scoop of sand and put it on the screen and sift it and see what's left. 
but why are they digging here as opposed to some other part of the shore? As we've already seen, the Journal of John White describes the colony being built on a hilled embankment. But he also mentions one other key detail. The site had a large growth of scuppernong grapevines. There is one part of the island with grapevines that old, but it sits three miles away from the currently accepted location of the colony. A lot of the geographical features here actually match what John White wrote about in 1590. He said that when they rode over here to try to find the colony, that it was high sandy banks, which all this would have been then. Could this actually be where the Roanoke colony was built? There's only one way to find out. Unfortunately, it comes with many challenges. As opposed to an archeological dig on land, there's almost no visibility underwater. So the team must blindly keep track of their search area as they bring up one shovel of earth at a time. What I'm hoping to find is a little ring that says on there, Virginia Day. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you, could, you could be in this next bucket. Well, here it comes. I like doing this because of the venture of it not knowing what you're going to bring up from one shovel to the next. Are we going to solve the mystery? To search the deeper areas, Anne has also brought in professional divers, Duncan Pinnock and Randy Glaze. We typically do a lot of diving in blackwater rivers looking for artifacts and fossils. So today, we brought scooters to try to clear sand, which is what we typically would do in rivers. They're also armed with an underwater metal detector and high-powered lights to cut through the sound's murky water. There is rumor of cannon potentially with the lost colony. That would be exceptionally cool. As the divers head out, the shallow water team finds their first artifact of the day. Hey, I found something. Found an old piece of pottery. And this piece isn't the only one. Before long, they start to unearth several more objects from the past. But unfortunately, these pieces are from the 17th and 18th centuries. There's absolutely stuff under there from the 1500s. Just finding it is the problem. With you probably got yeah, I don't doubt five to ten is. feet of sand above it. If there's stuff out there, it's very well buried under all the sand. That's it's 500 around. years of sand here. The methodical work continues. If this site holds proof of the original Roanoke settlement, it could potentially take years or even decades to find it. It's like every time you bring something up, you're hoping it's that in there. That Hey, I found a piece of pottery! It may not look like much, but Robbie might have just made an incredible discovery. This shard is unlike any of the others found today. It's made from a different ceramic and it's much, much older. Any of the pieces that are, that are the old jugs and containers, you look at the ones that have been found, and you can tell by the style and what it's made of. According to Anne, this piece is part of a 16th century jug of the exact style and time period of the Roanoke colony. It could be the proverbial needle in the haystack that proves the lost colony was right here. Definitely a possibility that they, they could have been here. If the Lost Colony Research Group is correct, then they may have given us a key breakthrough in our search. As opposed to the original location thought to be here, could this instead be the site of the colony? If so, it has serious implications for what happened during their final days on Roanoke Island. 
They carved the letter C-R-O into a tree in this location, three miles away. Therefore, they wouldn't have still been at home when the carving was made. They would have been on the move, headed north. For the first time, we may have new clues about which direction the colonists went when they left their settlement. From here to here. And if we follow that path, it leads here, into the Albemarle Sound. So where did they go next? As we're about to find out, the answer could have been hiding under our noses this whole time. Thanks to a hidden map, that new technology has finally allowed us to see. The question of what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke is among the most enduring mysteries in the United States. But we now have a new theory, that the colonists headed northwest from Roanoke into the Albemarle Sound. Where did they go from there? We may already have the answer, thanks to a hidden map that has only recently been revealed. In 2012, historians uncovered a shocking new clue in the hunt for the lost colony of Roanoke. They examined something called the Virginia Pars map. It was painted by Roanoke's governor, John White. The map reveals useful routes for navigating the rough waters of the Atlantic, as well as many Native American villages. But in 2012, it revealed quite a bit more. The British Museum discovered two small patches where extra paper had been applied over top of the map. New technology allowed scientists to see beneath these patches without disturbing them. And there, they made an incredible find. Governor White had painted a fort here, along the coast of the Albemarle Sound, and then covered it up. What could this possibly mean? Could this secret fort, purposely covered up in John White's map, represent a new home for the relocated colonists of Roanoke? Archaeologists have named the fort Site X, and it's here that the mystery deepens. We're on our way to Site X. It's a little way up the Albemarle Sound, and it's a possible location for some of the lost colonists to have settled after 1587. Looking at the map, it's easy to see how the colonists could have navigated up through the sound. This is an incredibly detailed map. It measures about 18 by 9 inches, so it's quite small. But even today, it's still recognizable. You can still see the Outer Banks region, the Roanoke Island, Lake Madame Mesquite. It's incredibly detailed. It's a beautiful, beautiful map. It begs the question, how could Governor White have known this much about the area in such a short time? And how would he have been aware of a fort over 50 miles away? As it turns out, 1587 wasn't the first time John White visited the area. He had been here two years before, as part of an expedition led by Sir Ralph Lane, who established a fort in Albemarle Sound. But this early visit to the New World quickly took a turn for the worse when the English accused the natives of stealing from them. As retribution, Ralph Lane burned their village, killing several tribe members. Soon, those tensions led the English to abandon the fort and return home. Lane's fort was here, in the exact spot that was marked on John White's map. The question is, if John White and the rest of the Roanoke colonists knew about the fort, could this be where they went after abandoning their own colony? We are now in the area known as Site X. This is being explored and some archaeological excavations have taken place here with the First Colony Foundation. Many people believe that some of the colonists would have settled here. It is the location that is hidden on the map by a little piece of paper. 
Excavations in this area have turned up signs of life, including a mix of pottery, some from the local tribes and some from a lot farther away. They've uncovered some border ware, quite a few fragments of border ware, and three pieces of North Devon baluster ware, which is very typical of the sort of storage jars of the period. In other words, pottery from England has been discovered on this site. Could this have come from the survivors of the lost colony of Roanoke? Researchers here are convinced that it could, but Andy isn't so sure. The important thing to understand about border ware was that it was prolific. It was the pottery of choice for London. Essentially, you could find this stuff everywhere you go in London. It was produced right up until the mid-19th century. And there's one more reason the colonists might not have relocated here, their safety. The biggest flaw with the idea of the colonists relocating to the area is the existence of the Mango Axe and the Chuanist, who Ralph Lane records fighting with back in 1585. John White knew that the natives here were hostile. Ralph Lane's expedition barely managed to escape their wrath. So the question is, were the Roanoke colonists desperate enough to enter this dangerous territory, or did they eventually change course and head somewhere else? That's almost certainly why the decision was made to move to be with the more friendly Native American Indians. But what is absolutely certain is that the lost colonists needed the help of the Native American Indians to survive. Did the natives at Site X suddenly have a change of heart and become friendly toward the colonists? Or was it a different friendly tribe that took them in? Imagine you leave your hometown. Maybe you're going off to college or a tour of duty in the military. Three years later, you come back and your town is gone. What would you do? Where would you start looking? This is exactly what happened to Governor John White when he returned to Roanoke Island on August 18th, 1590. His daughter, his granddaughter, dozens of dear friends, the entire colony he had worked so hard to establish, all vanished. That day, he searched the island and found the letters C-R-O carved into a tree. Some of White's men assumed the colonists had been attacked and killed by the Croatoan tribe, but the governor had a different idea. He thought the colonists went peacefully to join the Croatoan at their home on Hatteras Island. Unfortunately, he was never able to find out the truth. Governor White attempted to sail south to Hatteras, but severe storms kept pushing his ships in the opposite direction. Eventually, the crew was forced to return to England. But was White's theory correct? Is it possible that the colonists successfully relocated to Hatteras Island? So far, we've tracked the colonists from here, where they may have originated, to here, where they carved their cryptic message into a tree. From this point, they had only two options. Continue straight up the Albemarle Sound into hostile territory, or turn left and sail south towards Hatteras. It's a journey that historian Scott Dawson is taking today because he believes he has absolute proof that the colonists did indeed join the Croatoan tribe. We are now embarking on the same path that the Lost Colony took to go from Roanoke Island to Croatoan, which is now called Hatteras. Scott believes this would have been their best chance of survival because there were no friendly tribes left on the mainland. The colony came to Croatoan for pretty simple reasons. Everybody else wanted to kill them. They had nowhere else to go.
Today, Scott is taking us to the site of a Croatoan village, where he claims he's found a great deal of evidence that this is where the colonists ended up. We're on our way to one of the main dig sites. This is a real cornucopia of artifacts from the colonists. It's the closest thing to time travel you'll ever do. Scott is convinced that the Roanoke colonists lived with the Hatteras natives on the remote northern edge of the island. Scott and archaeologist Mark Horton have conducted yearly digs here for the past decade. After each dig, they must recover the site for protection. But without fail, every time they come back, they find more and more evidence that the Roanoke colonists may have ended up on Hatteras. So this right here, this clearing, is where some of your colonists ended up living with the Croatoan Indians. We found, right where I'm standing, a giant longhouse with fire pits in it, and you've got a mixture of European and Croatoan artifacts throughout. Some of the European artifacts that we found uh, from the 16th century, we've got a sword, we've got a gun. They also discovered 16th century German stoneware, a copper ring, and a 16th century coin called a Nuremberg token. The natives here didn't have glass, they didn't have iron, they, they didn't have guns, they didn't have swords, like these are all European items. With 10 years of evidence to back him up, Scott is convinced that this is the exact place the lost colony fled to for safety. Even though the dig site is currently covered up for the summer, there is still one area where artifacts can be found. 10 yards south of the dig site lies a large pile of discarded shells and other materials, the remnants of a centuries-old trash heap. While 400 years ago it may have been considered garbage, today it could hold significant value. Sometimes we will go back through a uh, spoil heap like this because there are artifacts that get missed, but uh, you just kind of rake through and give it a once over. And there, yep, this is actually a good piece. This is the lip of a bowl. And you can see, you can tell that because they put these markings by the lips. Through here, here's, an, here's another piece. This is part of the body. The fertile trash heap also turns up a few other items, including a nail similar to what the colonists would have used. And that's not all. Oh, here we go. Buried deeper, Scott has found a small piece of copper that could potentially be European in origin. He decides to take it in for chemical analysis. If we can drill into it, and take out some of the inner shavings to test in the lab, we will be able to tell if it is in fact made by Croatoan or if it came over with the colony. For 400 years, historians have had very few clues that they know for certain the Roanoke colonists left behind. But over the past decade, Historian Scott Dawson thinks he has unearthed much more potential evidence on Hatteras Island, 50 miles away. He believes the colony relocated here to live peacefully with the Croatoan tribe. Today, he's testing a newly found piece of copper from Hatteras to see if it could have been left behind by the lost colonists. This, if we can prove that it came from England, and we know how it got here, it, was, it is from the 16th century, it's at that level, but the Indians did have some copper of their own. You can actually drill into this and find out if it came from North Carolina or if it came from England. The testing process begins by drilling to the center of the artifact to pull a metal sample that hasn't been tainted by the outside environment. If the artifact is from the Croatoan tribe, it will be pure copper, panned from the nearby rivers. But if it might be from the Roanoke colony, it will contain traces of arsenic, which was used in England to refine the metal. Scott is already convinced that the lost colony ended up on Hatteras, 
This test could further confirm his belief. If we test this copper and discover that it's European, it's definitely from the colony. Very exciting news. And the results from the arsenic and the isotopes is it is, in fact, from either England or Ireland. This really reaffirms that it is, in fact, from the colony. The findings at Hatteras could be the first actual proof that the lost colony of Roanoke managed to escape their original settlement. If they fled to Hatteras or Site X or somewhere else, there is only one mystery left to solve. Were the colonists killed, or did any manage to survive? In the early 1700s, John Lawson was the first Englishman to explore the Outer Banks after the colony was lost. He reported that many of the natives on Hatteras had European traits such as light-colored eyes. Some wore English clothes and spoke English words. Today, there are still families living in the area with the same last names as the original colonists, including Dare, Barry, and Bishop. Many claim mixed Native American ancestry. Does this prove that the colonists indeed survived, blending in and starting families with members of the Croatoan tribe? It's an interesting theory. But of course, there's only one real way to find out. Computer scientist Roberta Estes is convinced that modern DNA testing can determine what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. Her organization, the Lost Colony DNA Project, is searching for definitive biological proof that the colonists survived after joining a tribe and that their descendants are still living in the area. The thing that brought me to this was the science and the puzzle. Being able to solve the oldest mystery in America, you know, the oldest cold case in America, what happened to these 117 people, and could we use the science to unravel it? We invited people from North Carolina and that area to come if they had the surname of the colonists. And a lot of people did, and they thought they might be descended from the colonists, because a lot of people have oral history about that. But is it actually possible to prove someone survived after more than 400 years have gone by? Roberta is convinced the answer is yes, by proving that they procreated. If the colonists did join the Croatoan tribe, many would have taken native wives in order to continue their family lines. If that's the case, Roberta believes she can still identify their offspring through male Y chromosome DNA lines. So the Y DNA is inherited um, by sons from their father, and it's not changed except for very rarely there's a little mutation. And those mutations are what make it useful to genealogy because we compare those mutations to each other in that line. And if the mutations all match, then we know that it's a from the same paternal ancestor, and so we're looking for matches. Recently, Roberta has received a DNA sample from a North Carolina man with a surname Brown, which was shared by two Roanoke colonists. Today, she's ready to test this sample with the help of Dr. Connie Bormans at the Family Tree DNA Lab in Houston. They're looking for evidence that this man could be related to lost colonists William or Henry Brown. This is the DNA extraction step. What we're doing now is we are removing everything except the DNA. Once the DNA is isolated, Mr. Brown's genetic markers will be compared with a pool of potential English and Native American ancestors to determine his ethnic makeup, also known as his haplogroup. Is there a chance he's directly descended from a Roanoke colonist? We're about to find out. Today, 
DNA scientists are closer than ever to proving that the lost colony of Roanoke may have actually survived. If their theories are correct, descendants of the colonists must still exist, likely with mixed Native American and English ancestry, which could potentially be tracked and matched back to the original colonists' male DNA line. They're currently testing a North Carolina man with a surname Brown, looking for just the right mix of genetic markers. So now Mr. Brown's results are back. And I've taken a look here at, at the computer to see what it tells us. And Mr. Brown is known to be both native and European. That's his background, his family history. But the only part that we're interested in is his Y DNA that he inherited from his father, who inherited from his father. The question is, could Mr. Brown's line of inherited DNA lead all the way back to Roanoke colonists William or Henry Brown? If so, then his Y DNA must bear European traits. If instead it's Native American, then he can't be a match. This is the moment of truth. Could today's Mr. Brown possibly prove that the lost colonies survived? First of all, he does match other brown men, so that's good. We know that he has a common brown ancestor on his paternal line. And I looked at his haplogroup. His haplogroup is his clan. So that means that I can tell whether he's Native American, African, European, or Asian at a quick glance. And Mr. Brown is European. So Mr. Brown is a good candidate to be one of our lost colonists. And Mr. Brown is not alone. Roberta believes there could potentially be thousands of other descendants out there. Someday, she may even be able to create a complete list of precisely which colonists survived. For now, she's well on her way to identifying at least one potential survivor. Today's Mr. Brown shares a surname with two of Roanoke's original settlers. He lives in the same area the colony once stood, and his genetic background is just the right combination of Native American and English. Thanks to this test result, Mr. Brown could be the link that finally proves that the lost colony of Roanoke survived. Roberta continues to press on, finding more and more potential matches, hoping that each will eventually connect back to the original colonists' lines in England. It would be a defining moment in our history. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many people have tried, but you can't do it without the DNA. This is the last step. The DNA is not the first step, it's the last step. It's the confirming step that we need. And I would love to be able to do that. And if I can't find it, maybe somebody else can someday. Our search for the lost colony of Roanoke has led to a number of compelling possibilities. We now have new theories on the colonists' movements and where they might have ended up. We also have evidence that at least some of them may have survived and built families whose descendants still live in the area. But there are still some mysteries left to be solved. What made the colonists leave Roanoke in the first place? Did they visit Site X or head straight to Hatteras Island? And if they did find safe harbor with a friendly native tribe, did they ever wonder why no one came looking? We will never know their thoughts, but we do know their names. William and Henry Brown, Morris Allen, Rose Payne, Virginia Dare, and over 100 others. Gone, but most certainly not forgotten. It's the oldest missing persons case in America. And yet today, there are more people dedicated to solving it than ever before. Thanks to their efforts, the lost colony of Roanoke might not be lost for much longer. The search continues.